So what is our show called again? <laughs> Releasing your inner dragon. <laughs> it's a joke saying it's been a while. Um, Watch me right. let it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hello and welcome again to another episode of Releasing Your Inner Dragon with Drake and Marie. I am one of your hosts, Maxwell Alexander Drake. I'm an award-winning novelist. I teach writing all over the world. I write video games and movies and TV and scripts and all sorts of crazy things. Um, as, as always, my co-host Marie is here. Hello, I'm coming to you live from my bedroom this week. My nephews are here for the holiday and have occupied my studio. So this is the boudoir edition of Releasing Your Inner Dragon. Uh, I am a fantasy YouTuber and author, um, and I host this post podcast with Drake. As always, I know you've heard this a billion times, but it really does matter. And most of you haven't done it. Like, subscribe, you know, share this content. If you're here, you're a writer because this is a writer's podcast. We're two writers talking about writing. So if you're not a writer, it's really weird that you're here, but welcome. We, we, we take all comers. Um, but that also means that you know other people who write. And we need to spread the word on this. If you get something out of our conversation, then other people will get something. Don't be greedy. You know, share the wealth with other people. It's free. It doesn't take you anything. Plus, it makes you look good. If you're like, hey, look, I found this thing that will help you out. It was it was you that did all the work. So it just makes you the hero of this story. So please share it and all of that. Um, so today we're going to continue plotting. Uh, me and Marie have been plotting a book that we're going to be writing together, that we're going to be dropping the first book at Comic-Con 23 in San Diego. Um it's turning out really, really cool. This is actually the first podcast of the new year. So uh, here we are. And I know you guys won't. Well, actually, I think we used all of our. Um, we dropped one today. We dropped the last one today. So this one okay. will go out next week. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, hopefully we'll start doing two again every week so that we can get a little bit in the can uh, for when we are off or whatever. So. Um, that's the plan, but this is the first one. This is the first one of 2023. Um, but today we are going to continue plotting uh, with the project that we're calling Magic Falls from the Skies. And that's it. It's just yep. you get to join us as we're kind of going through. I am going to want to refresh. I'm going to walk through, you know, want to walk through Act 1 and the first half Act 2 and the second half Act 2, which we've gotten pretty well nailed down. I mean, every act is a little weaker as you go through and you know every time we go through it we add to it and if you guys well you guys haven't been following a hundred percent because some of the stuff we've been doing offline um because we also there's just not enough time in a 45 minute podcast to plot an entire novel so we've, we've been having sessions of our own that we have been recording so maybe we put together some type of thing uh and release that later but i know at least on the last podcast there is a ton of stuff in here that just did not exist uh, when we went through there, because every time we go through it, we add some stuff. So that's pretty much what we're going to be doing. Yep. Um, we're just going to, you know, we've got a one note document that we're using for all the stuff. It's a lot of ideas. It's a lot of kind of working pieces and moving stuff around and, and chasing one rabbit and thinking it's a great idea only later to come up with a different rabbit that replaces it because it's just a better idea. Uh, and that's really, for me, what plotting is. And that's why I love plotting and why I'm such a heavy plotter. Because, again, I don't think the best idea is the first idea. Okay. So let's get into it. All right. So uh, I will recap for us, starting in Act 1, Scene 1. So this will be our opening chapter. It will be from the female character, Buri's perspective. And it'll open in her shop, basically establishing her everyman moment, including her flying cat teacup. Now, Buri is in a very rough place in her life. Um, she Her magic is not a stable form of magic. She gets uh, issues every time that she she, she uses uh, Jiren to bake magical goods. But her her baking always has bad side effects. Like sometimes it'll make people hallucinate, or sometimes it'll make them throw up, or you know whatever. There'll there'll be side effects to it. And and the, and the backstory to this is the bake shop, the magic bake shop, was really her sister's, mm. and her sister was 
renowned for it. Like people would come even from other districts to buy her pastry is because they could, you know, these are magic. So they can, you, you buy them to do certain things. I don't know if we have um, this, but as yeah. a shorthand, uh, like the alchemist who sells the love potion. Um, so, you know, maybe, but that love yeah. potions are always a little bit rapey to me. So yeah, I, always, I, 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 don't, really, I don't like those. I, really I, like I steer clear of them. I, yeah. um, but it's a good shorthand because it's been in yeah. a lot of fairy tales and stuff like that. Um, but her sister has contracted a uh, disease that is not curable by the society or not curable cheap by the society. And so she's in kind of a hair facility um, to ease her pain or ease her whatever. Uh, we're still fleshing all that out. But uh, Baburi has been thrust to keep the family business alive and is failing miserably. And Buri so, also needs money in order to cure her sister because a sufficient mm -hmm. amount of jiren will allow her sister to complete the transition uh, through to fully adapted, which she could then, she would then at least survive the illness. Yeah, because she's the, the illness is a type of magic poisoning. Mm. So as you use the magic, you can become poisoned by it or whatever. It's mm. not exactly that, but that's an easy way to kind of think about it. So um, we, once we've established the, the shop and so on, a customer is going to come in and he's going to demand a refund from Buri because of, you know, the side effects caused by her magic. Um, she's going to say, "Look, I, I don't, I don't have any way to refund you." Like, actually, let's 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 yeah. bolster that. Um, and I'm trying. To, I'm 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 thinking about how to work this in. So in the Everyman moment, um, the we need to set up that the only thing that is keeping her afloat even is the fact that she made the one big sale of maybe she catered a wedding or something like that, something big. Um, and we need to set that up that it literally, maybe she's talking to the cat or something like that. I mean, we'll figure it out in the details, but she's like, you know, if it wasn't for this one thing, I wouldn't even be able to keep the lights on or whatever. Um, and the refund is that. Yeah. That guy shows up and is pissed about something and wants mm. his money back. And she's so she spent some of it on the, the product and mm. literally. So that becomes this huge conflict point. But cool. that will really ramp up the tension of this. Mm. So this is what I mean um, for, for, for the folks listening. We've gone through this six times, that scene. Never really thought about um, that. I mean, that was an idea that just hit me as Marie's going through it. And this is why I like plotting and, and going through things over and over and over again, because you start going, you, you've worked out the big stuff and you can really go, okay, wait now, where's the conflict here? What can I really do to ramp this up? And this idea just hit me of, oh, not only are we, is, not only are we going to show that she has this, life crisis going on we can tie it all in together in one nice neat package by having her basically maybe counting the money and go this is all we have left from that big sale we haven't had any really big you know other sales come in like this will at least buy me another couple of weeks but you know what am i going to do after that and then all of a sudden once you set that up which is really organic because everybody's been there um the guy who is that sale comes in is like, I want it all back. And like, you know, and it just really shows that her world is collapsing in a very organic way. Mm. So again, that's why I love plotting so much because we hadn't come up with that. So anyway, sorry, continue. No, hundred percent. So um, they then have this discussion about fraud and he says he's going to take it to the magistrates. And this is a disaster for her because they'll shut her down because they'll put her in debtor's prison because she can't afford to pay him back. In this society, they do have debtor's prison, which is, of course, is a terrible, I mean, you, like, you're just screwed once, once that happens to you. Yeah, um, we're modeling, we're modeling the society off of, um, you know, early England where, it was it was pretty much brutal for anybody who wasn't, you know, in the upper echelon. Yeah. Uh, if you were a working skag, you were your you life were could be destroyed screwed. in any moment. Yeah. And that's kind of where we're going with this. So it's it kind of is almost starting to give it a, a steampunky feel mm. 
to the uh to the society which i think is really cool um so while they're having this discussion um the a messenger comes in and with the notification that she's been selected to go on a um a Jiren fall a, a dragon fall event and she has to you know get her equipment together and get out there and she's like dude i can't do this now and he's like well you know like do you want to like default on your citizenship obligations um and obviously you can't do that either so that'll put you in prison prison yeah (laughs) and and so she's like i can't and then he's like lady i'm just the messenger so um she then accepts it he transfers to her the amount of money that she's supposed to use in order to outfit herself for this expedition. But then she turns around and dude from the wedding, you know, looks at her with a sm- shock smile. And he's like, I guess you've got the money to refund me now. And there goes basically all the money that was supposed to go on outfitting her. So now she's still broke and she has to go do this thing that she has no equipment for. And in one, probably around 3,500 word scene, you have this massive hook for the audience, this massive introduction of a, of a character who's behind the eight ball that you want to see succeed. It's like, this is what we're looking for for an opening scene. We're looking for just like, you know, all the crap that this, this character is going to have to go through and you're now hooked into the story and want to see where it goes from here. Mm. And so as a story creator, this is literally what, you know, I'm looking for, for an opening scene that is just this, this amazing opening of conflict and world building and everything. And it's all organic. So, you know, that's the thing that, that I definitely look for when I'm, when I'm creating my stories. So I love this scene. I love this opening scene. And then the scene will end, the hook through will be the scene where Jer- Buri decides, okay, I'm I'm going to have to go see my district captain, uh, my precinct captain, to try and get, you know, some of the precinct equip- equipment, at least a respirator or something like that, so that I can at least survive the trip. And that's where the chapter will end. This chapter also importantly needs to introduce the Jiren wrist guard that gives you some things that everybody can do, including spending Jiren and accepting Jiren and using it as money and all of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Also in this scene, she will lock teacup up, even though, you know, teacup doesn't like it very much um, because she's going to go see the captain. And this is going to, establish teacups escape tendencies yeah because we need that later okay then scene two we switch to the male pov who is lyron um now lyron is an upper echelon kid he's you know part of the one percent um and in the scene he starts out as an observer while his father has a visitor um and this visitor and his father is discussing his father's manipulation of the Dragonfall event that we, you know, learned about in scene one. And um, the visitor's like, you know, that there's going to be a lot of death in this manipulation. Um, and his father says, who cares? You know, it's a very kind of callous conversation along those lines. Um, the noble visitor will ask, like, how are you going to how manage the sa- sabotage? And his father will be like, I've got a guy. Um, now, the key component here is that the noble visitor and Lyran's father are working together against the number one noble of the city. That's what this whole plot is about. It's about um, establishing that 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 kind of noble politics that goes on at the upper echelon and where Lyran's father falls in all this. Then after the noble visitor leaves, um, Lyron who has been trying to prove himself to his father, will approach his father and offer to help him in this 
um, manipulation of the Dragonfall hunt in order to go the way they wanted to go. And his father will respond with something like, help me, you can't help me, you should have died instead of your mother, and then Lyron will flee the scene. So in here, for the listeners, this is an example of, a, in my opinion, a weak scene. Why is it here? Because it needs to be here for the story. It's got the building blocks, but it doesn't have the panache. It doesn't have that what the first scene has. So we're still looking for it. But the scene, we know the scene has to exist because the the building blocks of Laron's Lar story are here. Mm -hmm. And without them, it doesn't work. And so, you know, and that's what I'm doing every time we're going through this. I'm always thinking about, okay, where where is, you know, I like that word panage. Where is the panage? Um, don't see it yet, but again, sometimes, uh, sometimes I do stuff, you know, just like a pantser where I'll know the basics of a scene and I'll get into it and I'll try to figure it out there. There's also editing that happens afterwards. So after I write it, I'll be sending it to Marie, she'll rereading it and going, Hey, what about this? Or what about that? And there'll be rewrites and, and everything like that. Uh, it'll happen with the first scene too. Just this one, I don't see the, the magical for, for me, yet. often I need to, like, I'm more in touch with Buri because I've written a chapter or two of her, you know, even though I'm not going to use that, like, because I know her better. So for me, like, once we have something on paper about Lyron, I think right. for me, it'll come. That, right. That... So just showing you that there's, hmm. plotting isn't perfect ever. It's it's about discovering and poking and talking and and going through yeah. so you just see two i mean it's just kind of cool that the first two scenes are just in juxtaposition of each other on strength mm. um so uh scene three is back to bury uh it's a bureaucracy scene where she's now legit trying to get a respirator there's a queue there's a lot of starving kids people trying to get out of maintenance lotteries all kinds of things she meets a guy in line and he gets one of the models available for the precinct, uh, one of the district models. She meets one of her fellow... One of her fellow guys who's going with her. Right. With, out with her. Um, and um, when she gets to the front, the last group that went for a fuel refill stop lost the respirators and they just don't have the money to replace them. So, sorry, Buri, but you need to figure out like another plan. The captain does um, does tell her that they do really need this win because it will bring a lot of resources into the precinct, and you know it it it's kind of a almost a Hunger Games kind of feeling. If you win, your precinct gets a lot of benefit, and you know you can, with sufficient um, um, accumulation, you can get a seat on the council, which is kind of the golden prize for any precinct because that'll allow you to actually like direct resources towards your precinct um so um and obviously that'll all be backed up with the misery that's just right outside the door yeah waiting yeah. to get help but also and and it's just I, I, it, you probably have it in your mind but it's not in the in the mm -hmm. description here it shows that when you have a society that's built upon you know survival of those that can just scratch out the mm. better than the others her teammate who we meet gets the only gets the last uh model or you know gets the last respirator mm. and he's there because as everybody they're all broke so if he can get a free respirator instead of buying one out of it he can use that money for whatever but it's not like he's as destitute as she is and yet he's still there should be a conversation between them where he's like you should have been here quicker like yeah. i know we're teammates and i do want to see you know us win but i mean i'm looking out for me first the team second and the precinct third um you know mm. and so it shows that when you have a society like that so you know that'll that'll more organic world building is what that is yes Okay, so then we go back to Lyron, who has gone into the catacombs. Um, he's fled into the catacombs, and this is our introduction to Ghost. Now, that's not Ghost's actual name. We just call him that because he's Ghost in the Machine. And this will be the reader's introduction, but not Lyron's introduction to this entity that is a uh, what looks like a spirit inside the machine. And... 
Lyron is obviously very upset and so on, and Ghost sort of shows him various scenes and eventually will show him the occultist called Mota, who is um, working on a plan to take the entire city down. So he wants the hunt for the um, for the fallen creature to completely fail. He wants the um, he wants the city to fall out of the sky. Mota will say something about going to see the tinker, and then Lyron will say, I've got to tell my father. Um, and then the ghost will be like, whoa, 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 all artificial intelligence is forbidden. Where are you going to say you got the information from? Um, and um, and then, you know, Lyron will say, I'll I'll think of something. And he will basically take off back to his father. So I've been actually thinking about um, Ghost mm. over these last couple of weeks. Um, so a couple of things. One of the ways that I may run him, and I don't think so, but one of the ways that I may run him is that Lyron doesn't know if he's a somebody physical somewhere talking him through the thing or if he is something in the machine so lyron's not gonna really understand what ghost actually is um which does change the ai stuff and everything like that but it doesn't change the same thing it's just a you know wait a minute you promised me you would never tell anybody about me mm. how are you and he's like i'll figure something out you know i'm not going to break my promise or whatever um and again i don't know if i'm going to run him that way but what i do know is that it's going to be apparent to the reader, and we've discussed this, but it's going to be apparent to the reader that um, Ghost is working on something. Ghost has something that is his motivation, that is his driving force. And Laron is not going to pick up on that. Um, so it's going to be more random, because we talked about that, where... Mm you know, what Ghost actually is, spoiler alert, not that the whole podcast isn't a spoiler alert, since you're getting behind the scenes look at the creation of the story. Um, the Ghost is actually the, 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 the last spirit remains of an actual human who put himself into the computer system. And he was the head programmer who was supposed to be, was responsible for the artificial intelligence that is actually the villain of the story. And when they lost how they actually defeated the the uh, AI the last time as he put his consciousness into the machine. Now, it messed him up more, you know, sure, it won back then, and now we've had whatever a thousand years of of this society meandering on with a different course than what it originally had and all that. And his memories and everything got jumbled and he didn't have, he doesn't have everything because it they don't have the technology to put a human being inside of a machine. So it was something that he did you know, as a last ditch desperate effort in his story to fit, you know, to do the overcome of his story, um, which may be interesting if we ever write that. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, you know, he is, even though he doesn't even know what he's doing or she, I don't even know. Mm -hmm. I, I think we haven't decided on which sex ghost is. Um, I have a sex at huh? this point. Of, I don't think they have a sex at this point of their of their life. Right. Manner. Like um after you've spent a thousand years wallowing around in inside a machine's architecture. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean he's barely human. Yeah. Ghost doesn't really even know that he's working against this AI, but he is. His mm. is instinctually. So like the Moda thing, uh, as you were going through there, one of the things I was thinking about when I was on vacation was uh this scene. And you know, him just showing him, like, it would, it'd be a more organic mm. thing. In other words, you know, Laron shows up, he's obviously frustrated and pissed off and, you know, mad at his dad and all that. And then he gets in a conversation with Ghost and, and they're just talking about stuff and whatever it leads organically to Ghost saying, you know, you think you have it bad. I mean, like, look at this and look at that and look at this and look at that. Um, and he goes, and, you know, I've been tracking this cultist that, for whatever reason, want to bring the city down. And Ghost doesn't know why he's tracking them, 
you know, but he brings it up like, oh, look, this is one of the things that just interests me. I don't really know why I'm just mm-hmm. whatever. And that's when the conversation ties into scene two, where he's like, I'm going to make sure this mission fails. And then that that is what catches Lyron's attention. So I think it's going to be a very organic mm. You know, it's not a look at this cult. It's look at this thing. And oh, look at this thing. And oh, look at this thing. And Lyron is like, oh, that's terrible. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, that affects me. Yeah. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So then it becomes a very organic trip in there. And it keeps Ghost more mysterious and more because even Ghost is confused about what he's doing. And we're going to we're going to let that grow as he goes through and as he gets out of this city and Mm -hmm. into some of the other computer equipments and start piecing himself together maybe he was actually spread throughout and since they've been cut off from these other terminals he hasn't been able to get pieces of himself so that's something that i was thinking when we get to that scene where he's actually in there one of the things he goes like oh a piece of me is in here like what do you mean he's like a piece of me is in here i'm in here like i didn't know that and so like i think we could that could give ghost this cool kind of growth mm. where he actually starts learning a little bit about himself as he mm. goes. So anyway, that's yep. what I'm thinking about for that. And then that makes that scene a hell of a lot more interesting and and gives it its panage. <laughs> um, so. All right. So then in scene, in chapter five, scene five, we move back to Buri. Um, we will start in the bakery with her leaving Teacup in the shop, the shop and she locks him up. Um, building on, you know, the state of her life on the way to the hospital to tell her sister about the lottery. Uh, the loan shark will blindside her, almost turning it into kind of fake mugging. Um, and he will tell her that she has got to go on this um on this quest, you know, on on this on this fall event, and she's got to make sure um, that she she's he's going to give her an EMP device, and she has got to knock out the mercenaries, the nobles' um, equipment, right? Because this dude is, you know, Lyron's father's dude. So this is his plan for making sure the mercs lose. And it's and, one specific team. Yeah. One specific team of one, monks. One specific, p- specific precinct. Yeah. And that's how, the, uh, that's how the audience is going to know. Yeah. Because they will have already talked about. Exactly. Um, you know, how are you going to precinct A? How are you going to, yeah. you know, they always have the best mercs and the best equipment, and the best everything. Like, how are you going to knock them out? And he's like, I got a guy. Yeah. It's, you know, she'll see a seal say something like, "You want me to sabotage my own team?" and the and the loan shark will be like, <laughs> "No, I'll be shocked if you survive." Um, and you know, uh, she'll also like she'll try and get the loan shark to give her a respirator, and he's like, "Nope, you got to figure that stuff out. You want like out of this debt? This is what you got to do." Then a uh, teacup shows up out of nowhere. Um. Because, you know, he's escaped, which is a kind of behavior pattern that we're establishing. Then there's the hospital scene where she will talk to her sister and her sister will, you know, try and kind of talk her up to like. like, Let me interrupt. Um, At the end of scene three, when she leaves the. um, The place. Mm hmm. I think when she walks outside, you need to have Cheek up just sitting there. And he, she's like, and she picks her up and puts her on her shoulder and like, let's just go home. I think you'll need to drop that in mm. to set that up, to set that stage. That way, when she shows up and has to go into the hospital with her. Yeah. Naughty cat. Exactly. Um, now, the essence of her conversation with her sister is going to be that she needs this respirator and she'll discuss this options with her sister, things that she's tried and her sister will disapprove of the loan shock. But she'll also say, look, we do know one place where you need uh, where you can get a respirator. 
And then Buri will be like, I feel bad. And then the sister's like, well, where else are you going to get that? Um, and then, you know, that that is our hook for Buri's next scene. Okay, then Lyron um, will tell his father Ghost's information, obviously sheltering Ghost. But because he shelters Ghost, his father refuses to believe him and rejects the information. Now, Lyron really wants to protect his father and he needs to protect the ghost in the shell. So he's very frustrated and his father belittles him um, during this conversation. And this makes Lyron realize that he has to take matters into his own hands. And he comes up with a decision to get onto the team. One thing that's bothering about Lyron, Lyron's story yeah. is his father. We need to dance a fine line between his father being a jerk but it's but not a complete ass hat because then I'm afraid that that we will push the audience away from Lyron because they'll be like, I don't want to follow Lyron because he is a tool who's trying to suck up to somebody who is obviously a villain. Mm. And so I don't want to lose the audience in that. So we're gonna to have to be it, it's been bothering me this whole time. But once you read that, I'm like, that's I really think- starting to settle in i think what we need to aim for is um do you remember early smallville lionel luther lex's dad man i watched that when it was dropping back in the 90s and well you know come on <laughs> so he I've was... had cancer since then <laughs> he was an asshole you can rewatch it it's on uh oh yeah i actually own them yeah like I bought the DVDs collection. So watch one of the episodes with Lionel in. But Lionel, in in those episodes, you weren't quite sure if you, like, you thought you knew he was a bad guy. Right. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. And and I'm also thinking that back in scene one, what might help there is that we beef up precinct A nobleman Mm. as a true villain Mm. and make it appear that these two nobles have a little bit more nobilistic altruistic reason for taking him down. So you know what I mean? Yeah. And then now Lyron wanting to help that makes mm. the reader go, okay, yeah. I mean, you, if if you can help, if you are trying to be a hero by helping your father and this other nobleman take down a truly despicable leader, um, I think that might fix the issues that that I'm that's mm. waffling through here. Lyron's father still needs to treat him like crap because we we do I do love the thread of Lyron's mother dying during childbirth and Lyron's father blaming him for that. But that doesn't necessarily make Lyron's father a villain. It makes him you know An a bad son. father yeah. and broken that he lost his his wife. Mm. And definitely blaming the wrong thing for that. Uh, You don't blame the child for that, but people do. You know, that's Mm -hmm. something that happens in the real world. Um, So, so like I said, it's a fine line. Because we also don't want to make him, it it can't just be, you know, Lyron's father is a good guy. And his, Mm -hmm. you know, it's still, they're still doing it for power. And still doing it for, you know, you know, I'm just as evil as the guy that I'm going to replace, but but my evil benefits me and his evil doesn't <laughs> yeah. um, kind of thing. Yeah. So I think that's much better. Mm. So and then we go back to Buri uh, and she is going to go see the Tinker. Now at the Tinker, she will run into Mota. Which, we skipped that in the uh, scene five. So uh, her sister. No, no. Her sister tells her that, like, you, you know where one is. They just don't discuss yep. that. Th- yeah, but yeah. this builds that this builds that Burry has history with him, and that the good yes. the dude is in, in you know madly in love with Burry. Yeah, uh, and Burry is not reciprocal yes. of that because that's so, important because it it explains why she's so hesitant to go to this guy. Yes. Um. So um, when she gets to the tinkerer, who is somebody that she's put in the friend zone, and he wants to have a, a relationship with her. Um, Mota is there and Mota 
um, overhears a conversation with the tinkerer saying, you know how much damage this can deal. And Mota saying, it's just in case we need it. And the tinker says, just remember, when this thing goes off, it's going to look like um, PD. I'm not sure what PD is, but <laughs> I, I know what it, what it what the thing is meant to do. So I'll figure what, it out I, when I write. Yeah, because I don't remember what that shorthand was either. <laughs> um, and then Mota leaves and Buri talks to the tinkerer who, uh, you know, will then make clear that he, you know, um, is very in love with her and she is not, it's not reciprocal. And he does have a respirator, a really good respirator that he gives her for free, which solves her respirator problem. And put a little asterisk in there yeah. at the bottom of that. Okay. And just write... Um device opportunity I do st notes like this uh, all the time where if I have a scene that is a great fit for something but I just don't have anything to fit there and may never even need it so mm -hmm. what I mean by that is if later on in like scene three or in act three Burry needs something to overcome something that might be a great spot to have organically where he's like, and, and take this too. Like it mm -hmm. might actually help you or something like that. So and, just a scene that, that has the ability to. I to think PD stands for plot device. <laughs> oh, maybe. Actually, I know what it stands for. I know exactly what it stands for. Cause this device is the thing that Moto uses to blow up the elevator. So that description has to match what the reader will then see is the elevator blowing up so that the reader makes the connection that the elevator is blown up with sabotage. Okay. So that's what it is. <laughs> expand that. You are, you are right. I remember all that now. Will look like elevator blowing up. <laughs> you may, may want to quote that. I'll, I'll italic it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's right. I do remember that yeah. now. Yeah. And it's important because the way that I describe it here has to match the way that you write it when you're writing it from Lyron's point of view. Right. When he watches the, the thing blow up. Yeah. So that's, that's another great thing for you listeners. I think a lot of people mistake the fact that the character needs information. And so mm -hmm. like, though, like, like with this, where we'll describe what the explosion will look like from one character. And then they'll be like, well, you know, for the, for the reader to understand that it has to be in Burry's perspective. No, it doesn't, because the, the the characters aren't real. Only the reader needs the information. So I can give one character a piece of information and then capitalize on that information with a completely different character, because it doesn't matter. It's the reader that is actually putting those puzzle pieces together. And so that's what we're doing here. We know that it's going to be in Lyron's perspective of him watching the elevator explode. So that's how... That is our connection point but for the reader to go, oh, Moda blew up that elevator. <laughs> um, because I know, because in Burry's chapter, it, the explosion was going to look like a big butterfly bursting mm -hmm. into the air. And then it explodes and Lauron's like, wow, weird, that looks like a butterfly mm -hmm. bursting out of that exploding elevator with people dying and burning to death and, and all of that. And so, you know, it ties it together for the reader. All right, so then we go back to Lyron, who now needs to come up with a plan to get onto the team. He goes back to talk to Ghost. Ghost shows him who else is in the team, and he identifies a noble kid who will hire a mercenary. And well, they have a discussion about hiring mercenaries. Yes. Yeah. Um, some of that needs to go into scene six as well. Yes. Where Lyron, because that's where Lyron figure, makes his plan. Yes. So yes. six, he's making his plan. Um. And then, yeah, because that's your hook at the end mm -hmm. of that. And then he goes here and basically is coming in with Ghost saying, you have to find me mm -hmm. these things. I need to see this. Yeah. Um, and then Ghost will actually get into his arm device and he'll insist on going with. Now, Ghost can speak to Lyron with telepathy, but Lyron has to vocalize, which is a kind of a like, so Lyron can't reliably communicate all the time with Ghost. Right. Uh, Lyron goes to the noble kid um, who has just settled a contract with a merc. Lyron then 
like approaches the Merc and pays for the click card, uh, which we've established way back in like scene one. Yep. And he races across uh, the city just in time to reach the elevators. And then we switch to Buri in C9. Technically, which, he'll just take off running. Yeah, he'll take off at running. At the end of that scene. We won't actually reach yeah. the elevators in that scene. Yeah. So in C9, Buri is reporting for disembarkation. Um, she'll have a conversation with her surgeon, the leader of her team, about like what happens um, on once they reach the planet. One night getting there, one night getting out is their plan. They have a set route. There, we will establish here that there are ground dwellers, um, and she she has her conflict, her difficulty in the scene is smuggling in that EMP bomb that the loan shark foisted on her, as well as Teacup, who you know escapes from his lockup yet again and insists on coming with, um, and um, she will ask the question of why don't we go this way on a route map and. Uh, her team leader will say the mercs will go that way and they'll take us out if we interfere with them um and the we will end the scene with her seeing lyron race it into his elevator like hot footed into his elevator right and that the reason why that's highlighted is because it could go there but it also may go in her scene when she's on the ground mm. So it could go here or it could go in the next one. But it, it like, okay, so then we go to Act 2. Now here, uh, we now this open. Is, this is first half of Act 2. Yes. And now I think we... we'll, let's walk through this. Yeah. And let's end this podcast. And okay. you guys will have to wait a week. And then you can come back and we're going to continue on with this because we're going to do two sessions today. Um, yeah. But we'll do. Because that's where a lot of the work still needs to be done. You know, we've these first mm -hmm. two are, are really good. We got about 50% of the story really, really tied down. Um, and so we're gonna have just enough time, I think, to go through this one, add a few things to it, tighten this up, and then in the next, let's just do we actually had a different topic plan, but I'm kind of throwing an audible here and saying that we because I really we need to get this done because we, we do. gotta start writing. I got we a do. lot of stuff to write, and this is yet <laughs> one more thing. And so I want to get this started as soon as possible, yeah. have it done by Comic Con. Okay, so uh, Act 2, Scene 1, Lyron's uh, Merc team, like he sees the sabotage of the elevator. Remember that it ties back to the elevator blowing up from Motor's bomb. Um, yep, and there's PD again. Yep. <laughs> Solve the mystery. Um, as they... Um, now, this is... This team that gets killed is Precinct A's team. Yes. And so the mercs in that are around Lyron are going to be very, very happy to see that team dead. Um, because they know that that was one of their biggest competitions. Mm. And so, but they are very unhappy about Lyron's presence and they will actually sort of threaten to kill him. Um, because he is like, he is actually a danger to all of them. Yes. And it will then be Ghost who feeds him enough information to justify them keeping him alive so that he yes. can talk them out of it. Um, then they land in a relatively safe part of the world and the teams disperse on their given routes. Then we meet up with Buri and you can see there there's that duplicated bit of information again. Um Buri's team leader is quite proud of the route that he's mapped out. Um, but as they're following the leader's map, they run into an obstacle, like a swarm of parasites uh, parasite or a radiation pit or a big monster, something like that. And that throws them off course. This, this obstacle pushes Buri's team into a path of the mercenary, one of the mercenary teams, not Lyron's teams, one of the other teams. Yeah, there's, um, there's probably going to be three mercenary teams. Yeah. Um, because we've introduced three powerful nobles. And maybe that's even it. Um, go up to scene two of act one and just make a note. Um, just uh, it's dropped that there are only three noble teams going. And maybe three commoner teams or three scrug, uh, scab teams or whatever. Yeah. Um, so a total of six teams mm. um, so that we set that precedence. And obviously they're not worried about the 
the scrubs mm. like at all. Um, they're just worried about the other two. So now we know by by setting that up, the audience now knows that the two teams that are left are Lyron's father's team and Lyron's partners or father's partner's team. Mm. And as they're like scrambling to get out of the Merck's uh, path, the dude that Buri met that had the respirator, he dies in the scene um, as his equipment fails. And again, and, that's just an organic world building. You know, yeah. you, you hear me say that a lot, organic world building. Um, the reason, so instead of just saying, because a lot of writers would do something like, in the scene where he gets it, it's like, well, I don't want to go get the um, the equipment from the city because it's always failing and all this other stuff. You don't need to say that. You just need to to work it into where it just fails. Um, and then no one's shocked by it. Um, you know, if you really want to do the, the one breadcrumb that I might do is when Burry is in the elevator beforehand, somebody looks over at this kid and is like, <laughs> Where'd you get your respirator from, from the, you know, from the city? And he's like, yeah, I saved some money. And he just kind of just laughs and shakes his head. You know, he doesn't even say like, well, those always fail. Like they, that's the thing that they'll want to do. They'll want to do something stupid like that. And they go, like, oh, I would have done that. Those always fail. There's no reason. Just have him shake his head. You know, like, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything, but whatever. Cause it, it, not only does it organically show that everyone's in it for themselves, but it also, plants the seed of there's at least one person on the team that thought that thinks that's a bad idea. Mm. And then later you just have it become a bad idea. There's no reason to say the equipment of these scrub precincts are terrible. Don't use them, go buy your own. Yeah. Um, and so again, that's why I call this organic world building because you build the world without ever saying what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. um, that's in scene two. Scene three, we're back with Lyron, where they find the husk of a building. Now, there's this conversation here about these buildings being death. The mercs uh, are trudging along, and suddenly they get attacked by a stream of monsters, like in a never-ending march. So Lyron hides and watches as they fight, and he hears Mota calling on their god to bring down the vengeance, right? And he, the, the monsters are coming from him. And Lyron tells the Merc, stop fighting the monsters. They're under control of those guys. Then one of the Merc goes with Lyron and takes out Mota's team. Mota himself gets away. All right. Here's, here's, here's an audible I want to throw at you to see if you yeah. like this. Yeah. Now that we've locked down that there's six teams, what if Mota's team is from a precinct and they've worked it out to where all of them are... Um, from the cult. Yeah. Because then we can actually, we can have more cultists calling. They're all yep. working together and Mota can survive, but we can kill one or two of the other cultists because yep. we're not going to bring, I think we're changing it to where we're not going to bring Mota in. That, that That's something we still need to work out as far as the trio mm -hmm. is multi, Mota going to be in. No, yeah. I don't think we are. Maybe. I, I still really like the fact that Moda comes into at least the um, the first shed and mm -hmm. then does something that proves that he's untrustworthy or whatever. And then he they either kick him out or whatever. But that's I, I'm, I'm thinking ahead here. Um but I, but I think that it should be his whole team here. Is all is, and I don't think that changes what we're going to do in the no. future. No, not at all. Um, so they, 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 the the whole team does. It's the whole team here. Motor kills the investigating Merc, and that then draws the rest of the mercenaries, and they wipe out at least some of the cultists. Right. And Motor himself gets away. Then we go back to M Buri in scene four, where they find Mota and his dead team. Mota is almost dead, and Buri, in fact, gets him, you know, gets some healing magic down his throat and picks him up. See, and with this, we can change it to where they don't necessarily have to find the dead team. Mota can just come stumbling into wherever they're walking. 
Mm. And they're like, hey, you were from other's team. And and he this is because the same lie. He yeah. says, yeah. yeah, one we accidentally crossed paths with one of the Merc teams and they killed my whole team. Um, But we don't have to actually have them now find the actual combat site it can literally be just moda because moda gets away we know that um so now moda injured comes stumbling in to his team and and ingratiates himself because he still has his mission to do yeah so he says the mercs attacked us for no reason our team well, leader was hoping. i mean they i don't i don't even know if you need to add no reasons no. because we know that that because we already set up the precedents yeah. above where she's like, why can't we just go straight? And they're like, because at least one of the Merc teams is going to go that way. And they're like, so? And he's like, yeah, when we get down there, if we see a Merc team, they're going to kill us. Like, wait, why would they do that? We're all in this together. Yeah, not them. Yeah. <laughs> like, th that's not the way this works. Yeah. And, she's, and so she needs to say something like, wait, so we have to not only defend avoid being killed by the environment to get the Jiren. We also have to be avoid being killed by our own people. Yeah. And he's like, that's the way this game works. You know, <laughs> toots. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, I don't think, you know, no. Yeah. If, if he just says something like, you know, yeah, one of the mercs came across, you know, we crossed yeah. paths with one of the mercs and they're like, Ooh, yeah. you're lucky you even survived, you know, yeah. whatever, you know, come on with us. Uh, because obviously scrubs would, if it's always an us versus them and yeah. the the further out you get the the you still have acceptance mm -hmm. so in other words moda would still be accepted within these scrubs because it's us scrubs versus them, them. merchant or yeah. mer, uh, mercenaries yeah so he would be invited in with that light with the society that we're building yeah so moda basically says that you know he and his team discovered a way um and he leads them to a radiation pit, which they say uh, is impossible to cross, you know. And he says, no, no, we found a way. Um, and look, here's an interface. And he puts his armband into it and fiddles with the knobs. And, you know, everybody else is like, dude, what are you doing? And then he calls down a storm while laughing like a ma maniac. And this kills Buri's. Um, team members and she races into the storm fleeing from the pit so so this is the scene that ruins um that ruins the trio yes so there's a couple options we could do with this scene we did we remember that we did change it and change it back and change it back again so right. We do need to think about like because yeah. if we want to keep the if we want to keep the trio tension at least in the the first um, shelter, then all we have to do is make it to where Burry doesn't know that Mota did this on purpose. Mm. So one of the things just popped in my head is he can go um, no. My team had gotten this information that we can actually use this panel to open it up, mm -hmm. and they're like, "That wh where would you even get that information?" He's like, "Don't worry about it. You know, we just we we had a guy, and so he goes over there and he starts messing with it, and it actually does what it's supposed to do. So mm -hmm. it starts opening up, and then maybe somebody, um, you know, one of the team members walks like it opens up like a like a Noah parting the the Red Sea kind of thing, and one of the guy goes in there and." it crashes down on him and kills him. And then that's when it goes haywire. And they're like, what are you doing? He's like, I don't know. I don't know. I just did what, what the guy told me to do. It's, it doesn't seem like it's working. And then everybody scatters when the whole, including Moda. So it looks like Moda accidentally did it. But if we do that, then it makes me want to go back to the Moda scene with Laron because that's too in your face. Um, so we got, we got some thinking to do on this one. Yeah. So I've, I've put both options there in, in different colors so we can right. like think about it. Um, so in scene five, uh, there's a storm that starts building and it's coming fast and they need shelter and everything's turning to chaos as the storm comes up. 
and they find this husk of a building, which now is actually the kind of burnt, what they think is the burnt out remains of a monster, but it's actually obviously like a ship, you know, a, a husk AI. And Lyron's like, we got to go in. And his team leader, Mercenary, is like, no, it's death. If you want to try, you can, but I'll take my chances out here. And the Merc, you know, the team leader and the remaining Merc vanishes into the storm. And Lyron goes toward the building. And as he's getting there, a cat flies out of the storm and jumps into his arms. And that is the um, moment of introduction. Mm hmm. Then in scene six, it's Buri, we're all going to die. Okay, so Buri comes stumbling out of the teacup and she's like, you know, um, we're all going to die. And Lyron's like, come with me or die. And Buri's like, we're going to die in there. And he's like, we won't trust me. And she follows him because teacup is purring in his arms. Um, and then in the building, uh, there's uh, airborne parasites. In, instead of parasites, mm. what if... The reason why the merchant says no, bitch, you'll die in there is because they have some type of um, like little mechanoid repair bot, like a spider looking thing that the AI uses to defend itself and has killed any humans that have stepped in there in the past. OK, and the reason why Laron can overcome it is because of ghost. Yeah. And so everyone knows those things are death. But what they don't know is that he's got ghost in there to be able to interface. And so so the way I saw the scene was they get in there, they start looking around. Those things do attack. They go running from them. Um, and right at the last moment, ghost is able to subdue the 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 attacking force and the little droids go away. So I think that in order to do that, Ghost should have to interface with the actual building. Right. So they need to find an outlet where um, Lyron can jam his arm into. Right. So that'll be the first thing. As soon as they walk yeah. in the door, Burry's like, you know, but there's monsters that live in these things. And he's like, I know. We need to find this this interface thing. And she's like, I don't yeah. understand what you're saying. She's like, let's just go. We don't have much time. Because Laron knows, because Ghost has told him, you mm. got to get me there now. And so while they're looking for it is when they get attacked. They keep running. They find one, you know, because Laron maybe has a map that he can see um, that Ghost is providing him or whatever. They finally get there. Um, and he's able to insert Ghost into the thing. And right at the last moment when they're trapped against the wall and the little spider the creatures are about to eat them is when Ghost is able to you know, interface connect, you know, mm -hmm. armor with you. Yeah. I think that works better than just some random parasites. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then here is if Mota is with them, this is where Mota takes off his hood. Oh yeah. No, no, that's, that's right. No, no. Still, still, it still has to be that Burry doesn't know that he's an evil piece yeah. of crap. Yeah. So it will be, if we go green, then it's Burry and Moda stumbling through together yes. and Teacup bounds it out of her arms and runs ahead to um to Laron. Mm. Um and if not, then Moda's not even there. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. Because if, if Burry knows that she betrayed him and caused the storm, then she's not gonna travel with. Him. Exactly. So that's why like it's the green path or the <laughs> or the orange path. Then right. Right, right. Um, scene seven, uh, Lyron is like, he's, uh, I just want to check out a few things and he goes off by himself to talk to Ghost. Now here, he either thinks that Buri is in league with Mota or he doesn't, depending on Green Path or not. And that's why I think the Green Path is so much stronger. But there's a reason why we cut it. Oh, right, right, right. Why we had it. So <laughs> yeah, I remember. Yeah. So um Lyron goes off by himself, ghost is drawn to something, Lyron learns, and this is where your scene comes in of like uh ghost finds right a piece of pieces himself of himself. Teacup comes looking for him. Um Buri follows with Teacup and walk walks in at the right wrong time when she sees Lyron talking to an AI what she thinks of as an AI. And then 
the next chapter, she reacts really poorly um, to this because she's like clever, clever machines trap people. Legends and stories tell about intelligent machines. Lauren's like, he's not like that. But he thinks maybe you just think he's not like that. You know what? The lore. Let me throw this at you. The lore of the people. Yeah. The lore of the people believe that they used to live on the planet and an AI destroyed the planet. Mm. And the last bit of humanity actually escaped up to the floating city. So they don't even know that they were from that Earth is a different in a yeah. different solar system. We could actually literally call this planet Earth. Yes. And the reason why she freaks out is because Earth was destroyed. And so the audience won't even learn that we're in a completely different galaxy mm. until probably book two or book three. Perfect. Yeah. So yeah. what do you like? How do you like that idea? That's a great idea. I like that. Um, so she brings up all of that and they have this argument about it. And then um, there's a monster attack. Um, which interrupts their argument, and she uses the EMP to. Um... So that mean, that means that Ghost has to lose control here, yes. and Ghost has to say um, when he unlocks his pieces. Um, and again, this is from mm. Burry's perspective, which works really well. Where he's like, where Ghost is like, um, I hate to break in on your conversation, but. I'm in danger here. Something's happening. I need to get back into the wristband. Wait, what What do you mean? Um, and again, we're not going to get any of ghosts. Is... Well, no, because ghost would be. We're going to need ghosts to have something here that Burry's going to see. So in the last scene, ghost is going to have to maybe figure out how to turn into a hologram. Yeah. So and that's where that's what she walks in and sees. So, yeah, so we do get because we will need ghost side of this conversation if we do mm. this. So ghost is like, um, I hate to break in, but something has changed um, because he doesn't understand that he's actually at war with the AI. Yes. So he was just there and he's all amazed that he found a piece of himself. And this actually the reason why I think that's so important is, is now remember, we were having a trouble filling in a couple pieces. And now mm. we have another side quest mm. going to other of these things and seeing if we could rebuild Ghost. Yes. So that gives us a little bit more meat for the second half of Act 2 to figure yes. out what we have to do to the overcome. And I think I think we stumbled on something here yeah. that actually helps us fill this story out to the to the, the last little bit of the missing mm. pieces. So this is when Ghost is like, yeah, something is attacking me and I'm losing control. And so the monster attack is, again, the spider bots. Yes. And so they're like, oh, crap, because now that makes sense why she has to Use the EMP. Use the EMP. Yeah. Um, now, the question is, is why are their wristbands immune to the EMP? Because they're magic? Uh, no. Because they're not magic. Because they because they they go behind a um a, a lead interface. Because the interface part of the room is defended right from kind of emp attack so if they can get just their arms behind like a shield like a metal shield right behind the not screen. loving it but i don't have anything better <laughs> so i mean that works for now but i'm gonna definitely be trying to figure out either that or their armbands do get knocked out either that or what Oh, their armbands do get knocked out. That's interesting. We could explore that. And then they have to either recharge them or wait a day or... So let's think about this for a second. Because the EMP would be just as dangerous to ghosts as it is to the spider bots. Yes. So that would add a beautifully terrifying conflict. Mm. Because now Lyron is going to have to decide, let Burry save their lives from being eaten by, by robotic spiders and losing Ghost, 
or saving Ghost, but getting eaten, you know, getting his face eaten off by a robotic spider. Um, so I think it should be a little bit more complicated than just sticking this behind a thing. Like this needs to be a, this is a cool scene right here is all I'm saying. It needs to not be quick or whatever. It needs to be, this is something is all I'm saying. Mm. This is, this is something to be explored. Okay. Then um, in scene nine, we're back in Lyron's perspective. They face in, in here they find the the team that <laughs> Buri was supposed to knock out with the EMP and they're like, Oh, well, I guess I did my job. Lyron's like, What? Buri's like, nothing, never mind. Um the here they face an environmental threat. And this overcome requires Buri to interface with Ghost in her bracelet and links Buri and Lyron. The the beginning of that, mm. where they find Team B, which is um the other noble, the, the friend the, of the friend's so team. Burry's target was the dad's friend's team. Yes. Moda's target was first to blow up Team A. Yes. And then to just sabotage everybody. Yes. But Burry wasn't working for Laron's father in targeting Team A. He literally was just taking out the, he had one bomb. And if you have one bomb and three mercenary teams, you take out the one that always wins. That's the most yes. dangerous. So that's why he chose it. So it was just advantageous to them. And the other mercenaries would know that they are doing something for Laron's father. Mm. So that conversation needs to be a little bit more why the team around Laron when they're coming down the elevator is, is happy. Mm. And Laron's like, that's just a bunch of guys that died. And he's like, well, we were going to have to do that anyway. Yeah. And he's like, I didn't think you mercenaries fought each other. And he's like, normally we don't, but this was going to be a special mission. The Mercs thought that the two teams were going to work together. Um, Maybe it's because normally the three work together or whatever. Anyway, whatever. Um, that's We don't need that right now. However, this has always been a weak scene to me. So the finding of Team B's body can happen anywhere. Mm. It can happen here. It can happen actually in the second half of Act 2. We don't need them to find it here. So if you want to just highlight that top part. Instead of just an environmental issue or whatever, this this scene is the second half of the scene inside of Yes, because so, Ghost just got zapped. No, no. This, so there's enough in scene eight to where we can end that scene with Ghost interrupting and saying, um, I hate to say this, or I hate to interrupt, but bad things are about to happen. And then the bad things happening and the overcome of that can actually happen in scene nine, because this is a much more opportune moment for Burry to have to use Ghost to save them. Mm. So the overcome that you have there, the how do we overcome, it, it involves Burry having to re to rely or use or interface or do something with Ghost. So that solves that. But all of that would, would be scene nine. So they're not outside. They don't come outside until the end of scene nine. Yes. Because we don't need another environmental obstacle. No. So that's one thing that always bothered me with that. Does that make sense? It does. Um, and I think this conflict point is still an action scene. It just is happening inside of the shelter instead of outside of the shelter. Mm -hmm. And this is where she has to be linked with Ghost. And, and which, which which links them, which is what we need. The story yeah. needs them to be linked for later on for those listening in the peanut gallery. Yeah, um, a lot of these are we figured stuff out later on and then came back and worked it in. Mm -hmm. So, again, some stuff has happened when you guys weren't hanging around with us. Then scene 10 is basically um, they've got some encounter with plants, potentially. Um, yeah, now we're back in the environment. So now yeah. we can do something in the environment. Yeah. Then uh, they get to the noddy, but they get there too late. Uh, the locals are there. 
and Lyron's like, I guess that's it. And Buri's like, the hell it is. We're getting that Jiren and my district is getting their shit. Um, we can win this. Then they see Mota and he's in charge and Buri's like, help me and I'll give you half. Lyron's like, whoa, if I bring back half, my dad will love me. And that's kind of our climactic, or oh, that's our, our half climax. Yeah. Now, those are still just the notes of that. We haven't fleshed yeah. that scene out. Um, but I'm seeing it a lot better now that we've gotten all this other stuff. Yeah. But that gives us our mid-act to climax to where we lost the first part of the of the thing, and now the story just got bigger. Mm. And so that gets us. And we have a goal of now we're going to get this. Yes. All right. Okay. So. I think that's a good place to stop for this one. As you yes. can see on the screen, if you're watching us on YouTube, not as much words written in, in the, the second of act two and act three than we've been through yep. we've gone over this quite a few times so this is really starting to flesh out and become a really good story um so in the next podcast we will do at least the second at back too yep um we'll do as much as we can and then when we run out of time we're still going to have an offline session this week um where we'll continue on with do that because we got to get this finished this at the end of january we have to start writing yes so we've got <laughs> Two acts to finish, uh, second half act two and, and act three. Yes, I do divide a three act play into four acts. Um, so hopefully you guys will join us for that. And uh, and you know, a part of me wants to be dirty and and not do act three at all with <laughs> with everybody. Um, because then you you know you kind of have to read the book if you want to find out where it goes. <laughs> Uh, we are still writers. We do have to make money off of writing. So um, so maybe maybe that'll be the way it is. And then after it drops, maybe we'll we'll come back and do a this is what we did because we're, we're still recording those sessions. So maybe that would be the good. Maybe that's the idea. You guys can tell us down below if, if that really makes you angry. But um, maybe we'll do publicly plotting all the way to the end of act two, part two. And then we'll do act three completely offline with the intent of releasing it um a few months after the book drops or something like that so let us know down below if that if that's infuriating or if you're like no i understand you guys have to put food on the table as well i got five kids to feed <laughs> those people that uh look at all my cats <laughs> well that's that, a total that, recall that that's all a total eat. recall <laughs> line um so okay. yeah so we will see you soon for another one. Bye.